Okay, everybody, welcome back to People, and I mean it this time. We are thrilled to have you rejoin for our last block of incredible presentations here at Type 2023. This section will start off with Joan Horvath, who will be telling us about 3D printing, making math accessible. Joan, I'd like to welcome you to the stage now. You can please turn on your camera and microphone, and we are thrilled to hear from you. The stage is yours. All right, well, thank you very much. First, I'll start off with a with a few slides, and then um, we'll have a bit of a multimedia extravaganza here. So we'll see if we can pull this off. All right, so I'm going to talk about um, 3D printing making math more accessible, where accessible has a lot of meanings, and I want to give uh, credit for uh, to two things, to two people, one person, and one institution. So Rich Cameron is sitting here and he'll be doing part of the multimedia background here. And uh, everything here is done jointly with him. And also we had some support for from the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. So just to acknowledge both of those things. Um, so who are we? Uh, Non-scriptum and just turned eight years old. It's a partnership of uh, Rich, and, uh, Rich and I. Um, we uh, develop uh, training for 3D printing, printing per se. We have a lot of classes on LinkedIn Learning. Um, we are working right now on our 10th book together and Rich is in a uh, leading light of the RepRap 3D printer universe. And we met at um, Dees Maker 3D printers um, and uh, realized in 2015, nobody was doing training. And so we started doing that and the rest, as they say, goes from there. So one of the things we realized is that math really needed to be taught differently. I'm um, an MIT trained engineer and trained very traditionally, but I know that a lot of people in this industry come into it um, from very different places. And the question is, how can you use 3D printing to teach math or science generally very differently? And so our philosophy has been that because 3D printing lets you make uh, objects very easily, you can start off with geometry and try to give people some intuition and talk about applications and then move on to doing algebra. And so we try to follow the principles of universal design. And, and if you haven't heard that, um, it's the premise that making something accessible for those with disabilities or maybe those who learn differently can often make things better for everyone. And that is our really great um, leading leading a uh, load stars, North Star, I guess. So everything we do is uh, open source, except our books, um, but all the models behind them are open source and they're all written in OpenSCAD. And if you haven't seen OpenSCAD, sometimes pronounced OpenSCAD, um, it's a free and open source constructive geometry program. And it's really great. Um, you, it's wonderful for schools because you can just use it and you code models in something that looks sort of C, Java, Python-ish, isn't quite any of those things. And it has 3D geometrical primitives. And um, there are block coding versions of this for the educators who are out there, but they are subsets. So our models won't work in those. But, um, you know, if you, uh, all our models are designed, so you're just changing a few numbers here and there, and we tell you how to do that. So you don't have to know how to code to use our models. And just for fun, this is what OpenSCAD looks like. And so here we have a cube and purists will say, well, that's not a cube, that's a rectangular solid, but it's a cube that's 10 millimeters by 20 by 30. And you can see that that's pretty intuitive there on the screen. And so what this program does is it makes this rectangular solid. It makes a sphere that's 15 millimeters in diameter. And then it moves it 10 in X, 10 in Y, and 10 and 12, 15 in Z. And so you can see that you can build up stuff um, pretty easily this way. And so um, we do have repositories on our websites um, that you can uh, see, and I'll get to that later. So one of the things that we got involved in very early was accessibility for the visually impaired. And we've had some wonderful collaborators in this space, including that the grant that I mentioned um, at the very beginning. And so an interesting thing is that OpenSCAD um, is uh, you use only text. There is no drag and drop in OpenSCAD. And some people think that makes it sort of old school and hard to use. 
But the reality is that it means it's the only one that can be used by visually impaired designers. And so in principle, um, somebody blind could make their own STEM models, their own visualizations. And the other question we had is, well, is this a way to teach everybody STEM differently? So our first books in this space were uh, 3D printed science projects. And I'll talk about this briefly and then get into the math models. Um, so these are models that were done in OpenSCAD. And the interesting thing is I'm showing an, an, uh, an aloe and a camellia. And those models are the same OpenSCAD model as each other's with different parameters. And so plants have a few basic um, rules about rules of engagement with the universe, if you will. And um, they lay out their petals to be optimal and to um, not cover each other and a few other things that you can encode in about a, a page of, um, of OpenSCAD. Um, and then the rest of it is is uh, making it more printable. All of our models are designed to um, operate without support and work on beat up crappy um, K-12 printers, um, which have often seen a lot of abuse. So these are not hard models uh, to print. And so yes, that Camellia prints without support. Um, we often ha also have a, um, a model and there's, you know, so you can now see Rich there. Um, we also have a model of um, World War II airfoils and that we call this set our uh, non-scriptum Air Force. And so these are all accurate World War II models and uh, of airfoils that were around then. And there's all kinds of fun stories about, um, about how we developed these, which I don't really have time for today. But basically what you do is, um, is you can angle them at different angles. So you can study how angle of attack changes, um, how much lift you have. You put them in front of a fan and then you put them on a postal scale. And so as you change them, um, as you change the angle of attack, um, you weight it down a little bit and the um, uh, scale will register more or less because the lift makes it lighter um, or counters gravity, I guess you could put it more accurately. So this, um, we've used these in, uh, to teach uh, kids about aerodynamics and to teach them about history of aviation and to do all kinds of things. And um, they're uh, not perfect, but they're actually not, not, uh, not bad. And, and so, um, as an example, the kinds of things you can do, and again, all these wings are parameters are different, and you get different accurate airfoils changing a couple numbers. So that's the pr promise of this. So people say, well, that's pretty great, but um, how can you apply universal design to an entire subject? You know, is there something where you could give us, you know, this is fine, and you can have these lessons, and we can stick them in with other things we're doing. But how could you, uh, could you, uh, do an entire math subject. And so that turned out to be a little interesting to get a publisher to buy into. And then um, after some shopping around, um, all our other books were with uh, A Press there. You see that pile of our previous books. Um, the uh, Make, the um, folks who do Maker Fairs have a publishing arm through O'Reilly. And um, they uh, took a, the chance on Make Geometry and then later Make Calculus. And Make Calculus has really uh, shocked everybody by it being incredibly popular. And so we'll show you some models from that. And it has, I'm very proud that Make Calculus uh, is the only calculus book that we know of that is fully accessible. There is an EPUB3 version on uh, the Maker Shed that has all the equations screen readable. So if someone is blind, um, Make uh, Calculus is the only game in town for them that is is ready for them. And of course, somebody can make the models or they can make their own models if they are able to do that. So we hope we have opened STEM careers to a lot of people with this. So with that, let me stop sharing this and let's go over to our other camera here and show you some of these models since it's, I guess, somewhat ironically a visual. All right. So uh, what I'm going to do for the most of the remainder of the talk is talk through these because I think uh, the examples are, are powerful. So what you see here is uh, on the screen is a triangle and you'll see that the corners are cut off. And so what Rich is gonna do now is to move those corners around and prove that the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees or half a circle. Um, this particular proof is attributed to, uh, to Da Vinci. Um, and one of the, if you move that up so we can see the rest of it, a little bit rich. So Rich's big insight when we were doing this is originally we just cut off the sides. And in an example of universal design, it was very hard to keep track of what went where. And he said, oh, well, let's curve it. And then 
suddenly we said, oh, well, wait a minute, you can make half a circle and so you get a second proof out of it. And so that's a, a very powerful thing. Okay, and moving on. Uh, the next model is um, showing uh, the uh, Pythagorean theorem in an interesting way. So what we have is a hollow cube. It's printed in Petchi for Cognoscenti. Um, and a tetrahedron. If you line up the side of the tetrahedron um, with the side of the uh, cube, you say, oh, well, you know, that's bigger. It's never going to fit in there. But, and so if you, we do a lot of events and we put this out in events and people fuss and fume and say, oh, it doesn't fit. And, oh man, this is terrible, terrible. But what you need to do is to line up one side with the diagonal. Pythagoras was right. This puzzle is attributed to him, by the way. And if you push on it straight in, it goes in in a disturbingly satisfying manner. People really just like that. It go completely bonkers on it. So um, once you do that, then, you know, kids really understand what the diagonal is and stuff like that. And they run around and show their friends and go completely berserk and it's all good. Okay, some other proofs we can do. This is inscribed and circumscribed. Take a second to set this one out. Okay. So if I have a circle, um, I can do what's called inscribing a triangle in it, or I can do what's called circumscribing a triangle around it. And so in both cases, this circle is the same. And so we can show that. And so you say, okay, well, that's fine. That's a triangle. But if we then side by side do the same thing with a figure with many more sides, I forget how many sides this is off the top of my head. But if you do the same thing and you overlay them, you see that there's a lot less plastic there. And so this is actually a um, ancient Greek proof for um, deriving, uh, deriving pi actually, is that they imagined a, uh, an inscribed and circumscribed circle and they could figure out the, uh, the uh, uh, length of the sides of this, um, of this figure. And they hypothesize, well, as it gets closer and closer to some big number, then I can get closer and closer to pi. And so that was the, the earliest way to figure out pi. And so you can just look at this and say, oh, well, as you get more and more sides, you have less and less plastic. Actually, Rich had to do some tricky things. I should say he did all the models. Um, Rich had to do some tricky things so it was printable. So technically, it's maybe a tiny bit more plastic than there. There would be mathematically. But, um, but it's a very visceral and a very clear proof of... Um, of how the ancient Greeks thought about these things, because of course they didn't, you know, have anything like this to work with either. Um, one model that school teachers go bonkers over is our, um, I call it our trigonometry slide rule. And this was done for blind students originally. So if we uh, imagine that the, that this is a right triangle here and that the hypotenuse is one in some units, and if we pick one of the other angles, you know, point to where Rich is pointing, for instance, the sine of that angle would be the opposite side over the hypotenuse. And we just said the, that the uh, hypotenuse is one. And so what we can do is just read off the sine or going around the other side, read off the cosine of that angle. And so you can play around with, as the angle gets bigger, um, you, uh, the sine will get bigger and the cosine will get smaller. And so you can do that. And it's um, designed with little um, tick marks on the side instead of labels. And uh, somebody might say, why isn't there braille? Um, but the braille gets hard to read. And so this one, you can read it with a, a fingernail. And we did use our blind tester to make sure their, their fingers are very sensitive because they read braille. And so you can run along that and read um, the, uh, the tenths and the, the uh, 0.1 digits and the 0.01 digits pretty accurately. And so um, I've also had pilots say, I want that to ca calculate crosswinds. And it's like, well, okay, I don't know. It's probably a lot of liability there, but I say, you want to go print one for your own purposes, be my guest. All right. Um, a little bit different is a um, little bit of a uh, move into uh, uh, archaeology here, or, um, or I guess uh, architecture. So the Romans had um, to lay out arches only had circles. And so they had circular arches. And if you take a circular arch and you put some pressure on it, you can smush it. Uh, these are 3D printed pieces. These are from our geometry book. 
um, and they're put together with museum tax so that you can model, you know, masonry with with uh, mortar in between. But on the other hand, somebody, you know, a few thousand, a few thousand or so years later, said, "Well, you know, wait a minute. I have a rope, but I could make something with two circles: center one circle on one side, center the other circle on the other side. All my bricks are still the same, except that keystone on the top. And if now Rich exerts similar amounts of force." Um, the force is mostly transmitted down, and if you play with this, you really need to exert a lot of force, um, and it won't go anywhere. And um, so it's a very powerful thing. And then we also made a model, this is from geometry, of a uh, repeated uh, pattern. This is called the Gothic arch. And so um, you can smush that pretty hard. You can see it's delicate. It's just a couple of layers of uh, PLA. So you can smush it pretty hard vertically, and it really won't go anywhere. You can switch it from the side and it's, it'll just, you know, you can see how flexible it is. So it's really good for talking about history, talking about, um, it can get in, it's much better than the, uh, the traditional um, uh, spaghetti and marshmallows kind of building things, which is good too. But this lets you, lets you change the parameters and let you think about it, which is very powerful. One thing that our blind users just went completely berserk about is what's called a net. And so you you may if you teach school you've probably seen these things made out of paper so leave it flat for a second. So if you look at that, you can make a cube out of that. If it was made out of paper, it was flat. But Rich's big insight was oh, um, you know uh, suppose I filled the volume. Suppose I filled the volume instead, and then made it so I could fold it. These are made out of TPU. You can make them out of PLA, but ours get loved a lot, so they are tough. So if you Take off two of the sides for a second so you can see in it. So we've handed this to blind people and said, okay, um, to little kids and said, okay, what's the volume of a pyramid? And they think about it for that while and they say, well, it's a sixth of a cube, right? And they can feel that and they can say, well, it's one third the base times the height. Um, you know, and they'll get there very quickly because they know there's a one sixth in there somewhere and, and it's a powerful thing. So um, so those have been very popular and, and I always have to make a pile. We talk to blind people because I don't want to give them back. And here's a dodecahedron similarly. And this is just a couple of parameters in the open SCAD model. And if you're blind, it's really hard to make these paper ones um, that are just the, the sheet, you know, they're, they're hard for anybody. Um, but uh, if you're blind, they're, they're kind of out of the question. And so, so these have really um, been extremely popular and, and I had to get um, TPU working, which is trivial for Rich, but was frustrating for me. Um, the book also lets you, uh, the geometry book also lets you learn Latin long and re doing an observation to learn Latin long and stuff like that. So moving on to calculus quickly here. Calculus in seven minutes, here we go. All right, so a little bit of a, of a difference, um, what we've been talking about is that this is uh, um, the curve X squared. So I have 0, 1, 4, 9, and 16. So we asked the question, this is just Legos. So we asked the question, what's the difference between each subsequent um, column here? And, the, and we show those differences, keeping in mind there's a difference between 0 and 1. So we, we just show those differences. OK, and then we bring those forward to make their own curve putting them in between because we're showing that they're the differences. And so we have the curve x squared and the curve that makes up the differences between them is 1, 3, 5, 7, which is 2x. So if, if you've taken calculus, you'll know that that curve has the fancy name derivative and indeed um, 2x is the derivative of x squared. And then if we um, add up the differences, we should get back the original curve. So if we have 1 and 0, we get 1. If we add 1 to, uh, to 3, we get 4. If we, get, if we add the next one, we get 7. And if we add the x one, we get 16. That's called integrating. And so that is the fundamental theorem of calculus um, in a minute. Um, and people have gotten quite excited about that. And that lines up with that lines up with a um, model that we've scaled to it that is continuous. So we have a curve. The curve of differences is at right angles to it. Don't worry about that. The curve of differences is right angles to it. You can kind of imagine that we have that 
2x curve there. So we, we let people move those curves one to the other. Rich will show you here how that, a little tricky with the camera there, how that lines up with that. So the, we have um, 3D prints that line up with Legos in the beginning, and then you can experiment and move off from these Legos that you've worked with. And we've taught calculus to gifted 12 year olds with this um, because it's not that hard if you think about it that way. Um, so one thing that is fun, and uh, this will geek out a little bit here, is that if you have a sine wave, um, its uh, its changes, its derivative is a cosine, whose changes are minus sine, whose changes are plus minus cosine, and so on. And so um, there are some really interesting physics properties that come out of this, um, showing a uh, a uh, curve and its changes at right angles to each other and and well there's more in the book so you can get into it but physicists don't want to give that one back um we'll talk a little bit about volumes of resolution which are a hard concept for a lot of people so a volume of revolution is i take a 2d curve and i move it in space somehow and then i figure out the volume inside it or area under it and so here we have a um a square and we're moving a square around the center of one side and we get a cylinder and that's not terribly exciting but what's interesting is that if instead i took the very self same square and i rotate it around a vertex instead i get a double cone and this kind of stuff is extremely hard for anybody but particularly for people who are visually impaired to think about um, you know, and because you have to talk about a curve and then you're talking about moving and how is it moving and how is it oriented and all that stuff. But with this, um, this model, it's pretty straightforward. And um, Rich has made the, uh, the closed curve you can use uh, pretty general. And um, so you can, can print that. And if you're wondering how you print this without support, that double cone is two pieces. Um, so you don't have to take it apart. That double cone is two pieces. And um, so it just prints. Flat and easily with that support. Um, we can also talk about limits. Um, so if you haven't taken calculus, again, it's a relatively simple, straightforward concept here, is that um, a lot of calculus came from a book called Principia. And um, Principia uh, has a model that says, okay, I have these these, uh, I have a curve and it's kind of inconvenient to think about the area under the curve. But if I break it into a whole bunch of boxes, it's relatively straightforward. And so we just have a model here to visualize that if I start off with a surface and boxes and the boxes get smaller and smaller, then they're easier to see. Okay, and I say I only have like three minutes left. So I think I will at this point thank Rich and turn my camera on, go back to the other camera, and see if there are questions. So I'll look at the chat here. Um, and people are saying that they, they wish they'd had this math. Um, and uh, so I will uh, share our contact information because I just realized I didn't do that. Joan, if you could please be sure to drop your contact information in the chat, as well as the titles of your books. Um, these have been so helpful and I've definitely been having people ask about your book titles because these are so informative and I am just sitting here like, where was this when I was in school? So, um, our, uh, our website's non-scriptum and everything's linked there. Um, I have our, um, uh, it's make geometry, make geometry and, uh, you can see it there, make geometry and make calculus. And if you go to makershed, makershed.com, if you uh, want to get the vis one for visually impaired, there's a PDF um, EPUB 3 package. Um, and the EPUB 3 is optimized for screen readers, so it looks terrible. But the PDF is optimized for a visual reader, so it, it's all perfectly fine. Um, so if you buy it and you say, what is this thing? It's, it's optimized for a screen reader to be able to read it. So you can reach us, reach us there. Um, but that uh, is fantastic. And I think you definitely have some new customers today because we've all learned a lot from you. Um, we do also have a couple of quick questions for you in the Q&A. We'll try to get through as we wrap up. Um, 
are these models all in your books? Do they include a lesson that helps the kids understand what they were seeing? Okay, so yes, the models are all described in the books and there is um, an open source repository on GitHub and also link for all of ours, they're all um, linked on nonscripting.com's main page under his pictures of the books and you scroll down the links to the repos are all there as well. Um, Cause one of our publishers um, not make, uh, rearrange their model website. And so we had to, to sort of move it um, to GitHub. But anyway, um, so uh, all our models are accessible. Um, and um, they are all uh, available there. And the we describe the math because it's a book to learn the math. So why well, yes, you know, it does do that. And um, for geometry, there are also open source lesson plans for with somewhat of overlap with the book. And um, if you go on our website and look under projects and geometry, you'll see those lesson plans. There's another which question. This is our other question in the Q&A, which was how teachers could implement that. So thank you for so thoughtfully already including all of those resources. So Joan, thank you so much for sharing with us. Everything that you and Rich are doing is beautiful. And I'm so glad that we had the chance to learn about it today. So we thank you for your time. And I hope to see you again at the networking tables soon throughout time.